Hey guys, welcome back. I want to talk to you today about one of the most difficult things to do in the Christian life. And I have to say that I'm probably not the best example of it, but by God's grace, I'm trying. And I know that you are too, otherwise you wouldn't be listening. But I do want you to see uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 17. So Romans 12, verse 17 where the Bible says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Don't let this ever be the way you respond. That somehow when evil comes to me, then that that justifies my giving evil to somebody else. Don't pay people back that way. Don't live a life where you're looking to even the score. Don't be a scorekeeper when it comes to human relationships. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And the point here is don't worry about keeping score about other people's bad behaviors or the way other people treat you. You'll just you be concerned with doing what's right by others. Put the onus always on yourself. And that's true of any relationship. In marriage, sometimes our mistake is that we want to look at, okay, I'm a husband. I want to study the Bible. What are the qualifications of a wife? What are the responsibilities of a wife? And and of course, it's important to know the Bible, but my job in life is not to hold other people accountable for how they treat me. That's God's job. My job is to provide things honest in the sight of all men, that I am going to be faithfully and honestly behaving the way I ought to to the people God's put within the sphere of my life, of my influence and focus. Look at verse number 18, a great verse that is oft cited even by those that don't know the Bible. Verse number 18 If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Let this be your mantra, that you're not a rabble rouser. You're not a troublemaker. You're not the the stirrer of the pot. Uh, You're the one that is easy to get along with. I I like that verse in James chapter 3, when it says the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then pure peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, easy to be approachable. And here the Bible says, if it's possible. Now, understand that with some people who are chronically irascible, this is not going to be possible. Some people, they just, it doesn't make a difference what you say, what you do, uh, how you act, what your attitude is. They just have their own issues. But as much as it relies upon you, as much as it's humanly possible for you to do this, live peaceably with everybody. Don't be a fomenter of problems at school, at work, at church. Don't be trying to stir things up. You know, look for peaceful resolutions. Blessed are the peacemakers, and you ought to be a peacemaker wherever you show up, in your marriage, in your family. Maybe you're a teenager listening to this right now, and it just seems like when you enter the room, boy, tensions go up, and storm clouds are brewing, and I wonder what kind of attitude he has today. Don't be that person. No, if it be possible, live at peace with everybody and let that start with the people with whom you spend the lion's share of your time, people at home, people at work, people at school, and people at church. Now look at verse number 19, dearly beloved. And I love how the Apostle Paul frames this because he's speaking to people, many of whom he has never met, but he loves them in the Lord. He's written this entire letter, this long letter to them. It's being distributed to them by a trusted woman woman by the name of Phoebe. And he says, dearly beloved, fellow Christians whom I love, watch this, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. 
So think for a moment to whom Paul is making this statement or stating this expectation. He's saying it to the people of Rome. He's saying to Christians in Rome who are being persecuted, who have been arbitrarily kicked out of the city and have just recently been allowed to come back in. He's dealing with people that that commonly know what mistreatment is. Some of them have been kicked out of their jobs, their working guilds, because they won't worship the emperor and they won't pay the little emperor tax. And so you talk about people that have been mistreated. You talk about people that have been unfairly and unjustly treated. It would be very easy for them to get even, very easy for them to have an attitude, a chip on their shoulder. And Paul says, listen, listen, I love you. I love you. But you need to hear this. Vengeance is not going to help you. And let me just say to each one of you now, either watching or, or listening there in your car or wherever, listen, my friends, I love you. Vengeance is not the answer. You're plotting your revenge, getting back, feeling good, making that acerbic comment, you know, giving the silent treatment. It's not beneficial. And dear, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Set wrath aside. Set that anger. And I know you feel it in your heart right now. I know sometimes it, it rustles up and you get flushed and you want to just, okay, give place to it. Give place to it. Okay. Better take that wrath. If you can even visualize it, picture it like a little hot bundle and give it to the Lord. The Lord, the Lord can handle it. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, or rather give place to wrath. Then look at it here, verse number 19, for it is written. And I love how the apostle Paul, this point is of so, such importance and it's so raw to the thinking and the experience of these Roman readers that the Apostle Paul resorts to quoting the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy to say, hey, this is not a New Testament principle. This reflects the very character of God himself, where the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 35. So this is of biblical foundation that I'm saying this. Now, look at verse number 20, therefore. So I don't know if I like that therefore, because in verse 19, what, what Paul is essentially saying in skelly language is cool it. Don't, re, don't respond, don't react, don't get mad. Take that anger, give it to God. Don't, don't try to have payback. Okay, so basically verse 19 is don't. But then verse 20 adds, yeah, and do. So it's not just the absence of hostility that represents our Christian response, but that it's the presence of good. So look at verse number 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. But wait a minute. He didn't do good to me. Yeah, but he has a need. Meet it. Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. You know, meet that necessity. Come alongside of him as a fellow human being. If he hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Now watch, the, even though he wouldn't have done that for you, for in so doing, and this is a, a, the verse I've been waiting to come to, verse number 20, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What does that mean? <laughs> If we read verses in the Bible, it's like, I can't visualize what that could possibly mean. So, Because if my enemy is thirsty or hungry, if I get to heap coals of fire on his head, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to go to the fireplace. I want to take a heap of coals and I want him just to burn. I want to put those coals of fire on his head and I just want his hair to burn. I want his forehead to burn. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> but is that what that means? Obviously not. So what does that mean, to heap coals of fire upon one's enemy's 
head. Okay, well, understand the culture back in those days. Fire, uh, the fire to cook or the fire to heat was essential for life. Now, for us, we just turn the thermostat up. For us, we, you know, we live in the modern world. But back in those days, fire was everything. It was that by which you cooked. It was that by which you heated. It was that by which you lived fire. And it would be embarrassing to allow your fire to go out. But if your fire did go out, if you allowed your fire to get so cold, or perhaps you were gone, or maybe something, some tragedy happened, the rain got in or whatever, and you needed fire, the best way to have a real fire would be to nurture live coals. So if you wanted to help your neighbor with a fire, you could take some of the live coals from your fire, put it in a container, they would carry a container on the head, and bring that container back to one's house, and then that person would be saved the embarrassment and the, the, the long process of rebuilding a fire because now they had fire that you've given to them. So you heap coals of fire upon their head is, is you are being kind and giving them a necessity for life in fire, that which they need for cooking. That's what they need for, for life, for heating. You're heaping coals of fire on their head, giving them what they need but do not deserve. That's one of the greatest ways to reflect Christ's love to others is to give them what they need but don't deserve. Yeah, but you don't know what they, you're right, I don't know. But you don't know what they did to Christ. In fact, we kind of do know <laughs> what they did to Christ. And yet, what did he do? Uh, he he heaped coals of fire upon our head by giving us grace, by giving us salvation, by giving us the second chance. That's what Jesus did. So watch the last verse of Romans chapter 12, verse number 21, where it says, be not overcome of evil. Because there's a real chance that when we're living in an evil world and evil is being hurled at us and it, it's it, there's a real chance for us to get swallowed up in the sorrow of that. But there's also a, a greater chance for us than to respond in evil and to be overcome by the evil of our own choices. So don't be dominated by, don't be overcome, don't be characterized by evil, but overcome evil. How? With good. So don't overcome evil by saying no to evil. So the Christian life is not a call just not to do things like, okay, well, I just won't respond. I'll just be silent. I'll just bear this in silence. I'll just separate myself. No, it's not just the absence of hostility, but it's the, it's the, pre, it's the, it's the good response. Overcome evil with good. Okay, you treated me that way. I'm going to bless you. You were cruel to me. I'm going to be kind to you. You didn't help me, I'm going to feed you. Overcome evil with good. The greatest examples of Christianity are the examples when you did something who did something evil for you, but you did something for them that was good and helpful. Because the world can't explain that. They can't explain that. They can't understand how Christ would ever lay down his life for us. But once they do believe that, what do you do with that unconditional love? You just celebrate it. And that's what God wants you to do in your situation. He wants you to show Christ to him, to her, to them, by overcoming that evil with good. That's a high and lofty goal, only possible through the help of God's Holy Spirit. So ask him today to help you. And I know that he will. God bless you, my friend.